Get ready for unique, rare, and little-known treasures from the golden age of radio. You're listening to The Amazing World of Radio with Adam Graham. Welcome to The Amazing World of Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Today's a special episode, uh, apart from our ongoing baseball series, as uh, we take a look at uh, Julie Bennett. Julie Bennett was a uh, character actress with a long and varied career. She appeared in a variety of programs from Dragnet to McHale's Navy and Moonlighting. However, it was in voice acting where she really left her mark. Uh, she w- uh, played the role of Cindy Bear, uh, Yogi's uh, love interest, uh, for decades uh, in a variety of different uh, spinoffs, as well as in the original Yogi Bear uh, cartoons. She also played Lois Lane in the uh, Superman Batman Adventure Hour in the 60s. And then in the 90s, uh, she took over the role of Aunt May after the actress who had played her for the first three seasons passed away on Spider-Man the Animated Series. And of course, there were a dozen other roles that, uh, you know, to some extent or another, uh, people experienced, you know, as children, and uh, but never quite knew who the woman behind these uh, voices was. I also uh, remember her uh, from growing up. She uh, appeared in an episode of Square One uh, Television, uh, which was probably one of the most influential uh, shows for me as a kid. She appeared in a MathNet case. When I learned about her death, I wondered if she had any radio experience. She was uh, born in 1932, and a lot of actors and actresses from that era don't, but I thought because of her extensive voice work, I should go ahead and check. And I did find out that she did uh, make a fair number of radio recordings. It was a bit of a trick to find one where she had been given a prominent role. She really began to make semi-regular radio appearances in 1947 when she was 15 years old, and continued to do so until a lot of radio work dried up after 1955. So a woman in her early 20s would often do a lot of teenagers, kids, uh, and various supporting roles. Uh, so it was a challenging sifting through that to come up with something where she'd actually had a prominent role. And we discovered uh, an episode that I think will work. It's an episode of Inheritance. Inheritance was a series produced by NBC in cooperation with the American Legion, highlighting uh, stories from American history. Uh, The series uh, was broadcast uh, a year after Cavalcade of America had left the uh, radio airwaves, although it was continuing on television. So this kind of uh, fills the sort of niche uh, that Cavalcade of America uh, filled over radio. So uh, with that said, let's go ahead and take a listen to this episode of Inheritance. Uh, the original air date on this one is June 6, 1954, and the title is But for the Courage of a Woman. <laughs> Inheritance, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Legion, presents a story out of that great composite of visions, struggles, and victories of the American past, our Inheritance. Yes, we Americans are heirs to a vast fortune. 
A fortune compounded of many things. A Balboa discovering a vast ocean to be known as the Pacific. Pioneers spinning thread for homespun garments. And the voice of a great bell proclaiming liberty. It is Coronado searching for the golden city of Quivera. And the embattled farmers at Bunker Hill. Let us now go back to a significant chapter in America's history, one we all share in our inheritance. Hardly a year had passed since freedom-loving settlers dumped the tea of the British into the Boston Bay in 1773, that the first clouds of war had darkened the horizon. And now there were groups of American settlers everywhere, guided by the spiritual leadership of John Hancock and Samuel Adams, opposing the British in every move they made. The Redcoats' General Gage had long understood that much of his strength lay in keeping the groups of settlers apart, and for one of the colonists to be caught in the attempt to somewhere cross the endless network of British lines meant sure death. And still it were these small groups of determined men which grew into the mighty army of the American independence. John Sullivan was the leader of such a group of men, while his sister Jane, under the guise of a loyal cockney, worked at the headquarters of the British High Command serving. Tea, General Gage, sir. Do you wish your tea now, sir? Gentlemen, I believe a cup of hot tea is in order. Very good, sir. General Gage, sir, there is a persistent rumor that another battalion of His Majesty's troops is on its way across the Atlantic. So, the news has found its way around already, Major. There'll be a welcome addition, sir. With our lines stretched for miles all through the colonies, they'd be hard put to withstand a concerted attack by the rebels. And I have it from reliable sources, sir, that the rebels are sending messengers here in yonder in defiance of your orders. It seems that they are trying to combine their groups into some sizable army units. <laughs> the captain's reliable informant wouldn't by any chance be wearing a skirt and have brown hair, blue eyes, and pink cheeks. <laughs> well, no matter who might be the captain's informant, I'm certain that he's right. These rebels are no fools. They know as well as we that to fight us, they must combine. And fight us, they will. Would not you do the same if you were they? Your tea, Captain. Thank you. Yes, General. I, I believe I would, sir. And I would fight hard. That's why I believe we must act with great caution. Great caution, indeed. It seems to me the brave Captain is making quite a mountain out of a small molehill. Brave men, Major, have been known to stumble over a molehill only to break their necks. Caution is a part of military wisdom, no matter who the opponent. But, sir, these men are nothing but peasants. Peasants who fought for every foot of ground on which they now live? Yes, they fought, but not soldiers. They fought Indian hordes, half naked, armed with tomahawks and bows and arrows. Who could compare those savages with his majesty's forces, equipped with the latest cannons and rifles? Your peasants, too, have guns and cannons. And what is more, they fight for their home. They're not a strange piece of ground far away, for which they care little. Oh, come now, General. You know these rebels suffer a pitiful shortage of powder and bullets. You're right, Major. And this shortage will surely be our strongest ally. Captain, what conditions did you find at Fort William and Mary? The stores of powder and ammunition, sir, are in first-class condition and of considerable quantity. Yes, Captain. Is there anything else you wish to add to your report? Well, sir, yes. In a way, there is. Well, out with it, Captain. It is just that it occurred to me, sir, that 20 men in one officer, no matter how brave, are scanty protection for so important a post. The brave captain, I suppose, would have us tie up an entire regiment to defend a fortification, with none of the rebels would dare to attack, even if it was deserted. 20 men, Captain? Is that all? 20 men, sir. Under the command of a Lieutenant James. Lieutenant James is a competent soldier, General. I've had the good fortune to know him well. It seems a shame to have so able a young officer up there in the wilderness commanding so remote a position. The Major forgets that these settlers need ammunition. And I'm certain that if they knew where to find it, 20 of the King's men, no matter how courageous, would not be enough 
to stop them from taking it. May I refill your cup, sir? While the general and his men lingered what seemed to Jane interminably over their tea, a group of rebels, among them Jane's brother John Sullivan, were holding a meeting of their own in the old mill by the river. The major topic of their planning revolved around the shortage of ammunition. And when Jane, late that evening, was able to join the group, they listened in eager silence. And then he gave orders to have the captain take 50 men to strengthen the guard at the fort. And when is this to take place? This is the night of Tuesday. It's Thursday he'll arrive at the fort. Then there is no time to lose. Let us get ready tonight. Uh, it's the impatience of youth with which you are speaking, Asa. An undertaking like this needs careful planning. If it's to have a chance of success... The night is too far gone. It's only a few hours till daybreak. And we must not arrive at the fort in the light of day. You men go ready the boats while I shall attempt to cross the British lines to get help. Cross the British lines? But it, it cannot be done. It must be done. John Sullivan is right, Asa. It must be done. There are too few of us here to succeed. We shall need the help of George Miller and his men. We need both strength in numbers and in guns. Don't try it, John. Think of Frank Post, the blacksmith. And all he was trying to do was to get a doctor for his sick boy. They said he was a spy and shot him. And now the boy, too, is dead. I've heard you. But still, I must go. Our forces are in dire need for powder and bullets. We must have help to take it from the British. I have no choice. I must go. Let me go, John. For you, there is Martha to think of and the children. But me, I have no one. No, Asa. I'd rather go myself. I believe, John, Asa may be right. It's not only your wife and children I'm thinking of. They, too, shall be considered. But rather, I think of your men who need you to lead them. You, Roger, can lead as well as I. My bones are old, John. My mind may be sharp and clear, but my bones are old and my body tired. No, John, my days of fighting are over. It's for the younger men like you and Asa to finish what we old ones have started. Then it's settled. I shall leave in an hour. All right. You know the British positions. They've cut down most of the trees. You'll have to crawl on your belly much of the way. It will take much time and patience and much luck. I shall make it. Remember, Asa. On your getting through to George Miller depends the outcome of the entire undertaking. If you fail, none of us may live to bring the boats back downriver. I know, John. I shall be careful. All right, now listen carefully, all of you. Here's the plan. <laughs> we shall take the boats, all of them, and row up the river under the cover of darkness. We must be ready as soon as the sun sets below the horizon, as to hurry will mean to be noisy. And it is of the greatest import that none of the redcoats at the fort are informed of our approach. Now then. At five o'clock sharp, before the sun comes up, we shall land below the fort and wait for the sign that George Miller's men have arrived. Now, this sign will be the hoot of the wild owl, three times in quick succession. I shall return the signal. Brother, I have decided I shall go. Eh? Please, Jane, hmm? this is a man's affair. You'll be needed badly back here. I shall go and take the message to George Miller. But Miss Jane... Jane... It has been decided that Asa will go. He will not get through. That's just a chance that we shall have to take. There's still some time until dawn. He will go part of the way under cover of darkness. But why take that chance, John, when I am certain to succeed where Asa is likely to fail? Don't talk like a child, Jane. This war is a man's business, Miss Jane. It's not the work of pretty women to fight and risk their lives. But you're wrong, Asa. It is all our war. Because it's our life and our freedom that's at stake. You, you may be a man and stronger than I, but but you will not get through. But on the other hand, I shall have no trouble. Thank you, Miss Jane, for we know you mean well, but it's out of the question. We're, we're wasting time. I must go. Just a moment, Asa. There may be some truth in what my sister is saying. In any case, there can be little harm in listening to her plan. What is it you have in mind to do, Jane? My plan is as simple as it is certain to work. But it may cost each one of you two or three cows. Two or three cows? Well, Jane's plan was as simple as it was likely to succeed. This was no time for false male pride, and at last they all agreed. Few people slept that night among the settlers... 
All had to help with the preparations, and it was less than an hour till daybreak when Jane was ready, waiting for the morning sun and time to start her journey. With her was Asa, young and strong and good-looking and scared to speak of what was in his heart. It's getting light, Miss Jane. I begin to distinguish your pretty face by the glow of the dawn. My heart tells me that I wish it was I who was going instead of you. I shan't be gone long, Asa. Just a day and a night. And when I see you again, the stores of Fort William and Mary shall be in our hands. Why must it be that you and I are born into times where talk of fighting and death fills every day and thoughts of love must be kept a secret? No thought of love must ever be kept a secret. Is it not for the love of freedom and country that that we must fight the British? It isn't that kind of love of which I was speaking. I know, dear Asa. And you must know that in my heart there are feelings akin to yours. For a long time now I have known of your love and waited for you to tell me. Jane, dear. You're a good man, Asa. And one day soon, God willing... We, you and I and our children, shall happily live in a free America. Free because of what you and John and and all the men like you have done. And maybe just a little bit, too, because of what I'm doing today. It's for our children, Asa, and for their children after them that, that we must fight to be free. The sun is rising above the horizon. Let me just once hold you in my arms before you go. It's time. Good luck, Asa. And do be careful at the fort. And you, Jane. May God be with you. Come on. Come on. Come on. You must wait, my boy. You'll get to use that shooting iron of yours before you know it. But I've been here a week come tomorrow and ain't shot me no rebels yet. Didn't it be a blasted bore? No shooting, no fighting. Aye, and every time I spots one of them wenches that works up at the general's quarters, he acts like we was worms or something's to spit on. Well, me lad, about the women, I wouldn't be knowing. You see, I got a real wench back home. And when you get to my my age, lad... You can do without kissing for a while, and you don't mind that. Oh, maybe you, old man, but I ain't dead yet. And if I can't go and fight, leastwise, I wants me a girl to kiss once in a while and a mug of ale to drink to make me time go faster. Well, old father time goes plenty fast for the likes of me, son. Seems like only yesterday I was a young sprout like yourself and plenty quick with the women folk. Huh? Now, nah, here I am with me hair all grey and a son soon old enough to pick up a gun himself. Now, uh, seems like I've been doing nothing but marching up and down. I sure wish them were able to start the shooting so as we could mow them down. Oh, well, lad, you was pound in the sack the other day when they caught that rebel spy trying to sneak through our lines. Oh, uh, you ain't sure lucky for him. If it had been me what caught him, I'd have shot him, sure. They shot him the next morning. Oh, shooting's too good for a spy. They should have hanged him. Here. You know, me lad, eh? I've been hearing rumors that we'll be moving someplace tomorrow, you and me. You, you mean we're moving into battle? No, not into battle, lad, just into new positions. Oh, oh, where are we going? I don't know for sure, lad. They say some fort up the river... I hear it's stuffed full of ammunition, and we're supposed to make sure that them rebels don't get it. Now, ain't that just my luck? Some fort full of powder and bullets, and I bet not a pretty wench within five miles. Shh. What? Now, what could that be? Cows. Ah, you don't say, lad. I thought it was the rebel army. What's so funny? There they are over yonder. 
Cows, like I said. An old herd of them. Ah, who would be such a fool to drive a herd of cows right into the midst of His Majesty King George III's army? It beats me. Blimey. Boy, my soul, it's a lass. Oh, and a pretty one she is at that. Well, my lad, I must admit your eyes are better than mine. I hardly can see her yet. Yeah, there, don't you see her, old man? Oh, she'd be wearing a bright blue dress and her hair is yellow like fire. Come on, come on, let's go see if she's lost her way. Could be she's a spy. You never know with them rebels. Well, hello, Kelly. You sure are a pretty sight around here. Well, hello, soldier. Now... Where would you be wanting to go with all them cows? How are you, miss? Hello. If this be beef on the off you're bringing for the cooks to slaughter, you're headed too far south. The quartermaster's up that way. <laughs> now, don't you be listening to him, girlie. As long as you found your way to me, you've been going in the right direction. Here, what you say you give them cows a rest whilst uh, you and me get uh, proper acquainted? He's not beef on oof I'm bringing for your quartermaster. Then what, pray, tell me, are you doing with a whole herd of cows right amidst his majesty's army? Leave her alone, old man. I know the girlie. She's one of the ones I've been seeing up at the general's quarters. She's just lost her way. Or, um, maybe she's uh, looking for a good man. That being the case, she surely found him. I not lost me way. Nor did I set out to look for a man... For if I had, I should either have come alone or with something better as chaperone than a, a herd of dumb cows. Huh? No, gents. I'm on my way to visit my cousin Jim, who bought them here cows right proper and legal. But he fell ill with the fever before he could drive them home. Uh, well, it uh, seems to me, girlie, there's a, a toll that must be paid before we can permit you to go on your way. A toll? Aye. But I have no money on me with which to pay any toll. Oh, you hear what the girlie said, old man? She has no money. Says she can't pay. What do you think we should do? Hello, here now. Where did he get to? <laughs> he walked away while you was looking me up and down. Well, good for him, leaving the two of us alone. Now, uh, about that fee. It wasn't money I was thinking of. Oh? That's more like a... Kiss for every cow in your head? That's what I had on my mind. A kiss for every cow? I get a pretty steep price to pay just to get on my way. All right. It's a kiss or you can't get by. Well, it seems to me some of my cows have already gone on while you and me have been standing here talking. It's not them cows I cares about. It's your pretty face. <gasps> oh, heavens, King George! King George? King George, the, the, the black one with the white face and legs over yonder. He's getting away. Oh. King George! King George! All right, wait up, I'll help you. Yeah, yeah, King George, get along there. Oh, Come on, oh, get along. Good boy. Get along. There's a good boy, King George. You go back to the others. Oh. Oh, dear. Look at all of them soldiers of yours coming this way. Aye. Seems to me like you lose your chance of collecting that toll you wants me to pay with all of them soldiers standing round here. Yeah, come on, girlie, come on, let's hurry. Well, let go of my arm, soldier. Yeah, now look, as soon as we get to them trees over yonder, we'll be alone. You better catch your breath, girlie. You'll need it. Not so rough. <laughs> Oh, you slap like you kiss, girlie. With fire. Yeah, let's have another try at Leave it. Leave me alone. Here, my cow. Oh, the cows be hanged as you are like. Come here, girlie. They're, they're coming after us. Let me go. Not all Let the me way. go. Not all the way they ain't coming. The territory ends right over there. This rebel country we're in, that abounds for us soldiers. Well, well, then how come you... King George. Watch out, here comes King George. Oh, me. Oh. Fox on, King George. Oh. me that beast might have killed us both. Now you let go of me. How but thanks to that riven beast I got you in my arms, girlie. And I don't aim to let you go until I collect me another kiss like the last one. I saw him running over yonder. He's a ready spy. Come let us go. A spy? You hear the lieutenant? 
So you're his spy. Oh, you, you ain't going to believe everything some punk lieutenant tells you, are you? Believe it or not, it makes no difference. He says you're a spy. When I bring you in, I'm likely to get me a medal. Come on, you. Let go of me. You hurt me. Oh. oh. So, you bite, do you, Vixen? Well, I'll show you. Hey, they got my knife down. They got it off. Oh. Oh. He's dead. She stabbed him with his own knife. I never find her in those woods. If the silent group of rugged men rowing their boats up the river under the cover of night and rain could have known of Jane's escape, their hearts might have been lighter. Success or failure of their mission depended on the courage of a woman and their silent prayers were reaching out to her. It is the blackest night I remember seeing in all my life. It is that and a good night it is for doing what you're about to do. You think, John, Miss Jane got through all right? I wouldn't be known for sure, sir. But when she makes up her mind, it's sure to take more than the British redcoats to stop her. How far do you think we are still from the fort? It's three hours to go. Pray that the rain holds out. Oh, I'm soaked through to the skin. It's cold and wet. We all are to be sure, but so will be the sentry at Fort William and Mary. And with luck, you'll be of no mind to be overly watchful. Oh, you're right there, John. If only we knew for sure about Miss Jane... Not before five in the morning when waiting outside the walls of the fort, we will know. It's the three hoots of the wild owl that surely might mean the difference for us between life and death. We'd better start working the bucket, Asa. There must be a foot of water in the boat already. Sure, John. John. Yes, Asa. How long since your father and mother have died? Oh, must be near on ten years now. Then if I would want to be asking for Miss Jane's hand, it'd be you, her brother, I should be asking, John. Well, Asa, so you finally got up the courage to speak about it. We've all been knowing for a long time now and wondering when you'd speak for her. It's funny. The courage it takes to fight the redcoats and maybe get shot, that's easy courage. <laughs> but it is the courage you need to... Ask a good woman like your sister, Jane. It's a real hard courage. I know, Ace. I know how it is. Yes, I guess most every man does. You've been speaking to Jane about this, I hope. She, too,'s been waiting. I, I was with her this morning before she went off to the British lines. And when I told her how I'd been loving her all this time, she said she knew. She did? Seems funny. How women know these things without... Nobody telling them nothing. It's nearly time. I can see the sentry walking up and down against the sky. It's about time you got It's getting me. lighter. My skin's beginning to leak, and the water's starting to mix with me blood. Quick, Beefy. It's not five yet. I'm early. What do you think? The rain will stop, maybe? Save you right if it don't. What silly owl would be wanted to be hanging around on a night like this? She made it. Yes, Jane Sullivan had carried the message to friends at the other side of the lines, and here they now were to help in the common cause. The attack on Fort William and Mary was a success. The handful of British soldiers, taken utterly by surprise, surrendered with little fight. The colonists gathered the entire store of powder and ammunition in their boats and floated them down the river for safekeeping. And it was the courage of a young woman by the name of Jane Sullivan 
which for months to come had made certain that there would be powder and bullets for every American gun in the fight for American independence. You have been listening to Inheritance, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with the American Legion. We are privileged this evening to hear from the past national commander of the American Legion, Department of New York, Mr. Edward N. Scheiberling. Ten years ago today, waves of American soldiers landed on Omaha and Utah beaches in Normandy, France. Seaborne and airborne troops steamed across the English Channel in the face of difficult weather conditions to establish themselves on hostile enemy territory in what has come to be known as one of the most significant invasions of all history. D-Day is already a legend of human bravery and military strategy. The term D-Day has become symbolic of the moment of decisive, courageous action. Tonight, in behalf of the three million veteran members of the American Legion, I should like to commend and commemorate those who ten years ago today, realizing the certain danger of their undertaking advanced the cause of freedom in the world in the landing of that dramatically assertive campaign. It is our native tradition that the cause of human dignity and individual rights has always been so advanced by American patriots. The land of the free and the home of the brave is not an empty phrase to be mechanically recited. It is a reality dearly bought and deeply appreciated by our people. It is at once the inheritance of our past, the actuality of our present, and the goal of our future. Thank you, Mr. Edward N. Scheiberling. Next week, Inheritance will take you on another journey through the pages of history, to a time when Americans dreaming of the future forge that which we possess today. Today's story, But for the Courage of a Woman, was written by Paul Garrison and featured Julie Bennett as Jane Sullivan. Included in the cast in order of their appearance were Donald Lawton, Nelson Welch, Hal Gerard, Herb Ellis, Robert North, Earl Lee, Alec Harford, Tom McKee. The original music was composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. Inheritance is produced and directed for the National Broadcasting Company and the American Legion by Albert McCleary. This is John Wall speaking. Governor Herman Talmadge will meet the press tonight on the NBC Radio Network. Welcome back. Well, a really uh, solid episode, and I really like how it visited this whole uh, era of American history that we really don't think about. I did uh, go ahead and check... And there's plenty of information on the uh, Battle of William and Mary, which happened in 1774, and information on uh, Jane's brother. But I couldn't find anywhere where her actions or deeds were uh, recalled. 
Though there might be a book, probably was, uh, since this uh, story was even published at all. It's one thing, I think, that does impress me, you know, about Cavalcade, because I consider myself pretty uh, knowledgeable of American history. And I think Cavalcade, as well as uh, the episodes, you know, I've listened to of Inheritance, didn't just settle for the basic facts of history that uh, everybody knows. Uh, Cavalcade, as well as Inheritance, really uh, looks for those sort of stories that uh, you and I uh, don't happen to know, and I think it's definitely a great service. And certainly, uh, it was great to highlight uh, the importance of Jane uh, to our country and to its uh, overall future. All right, well, that will actually do it for today. Join us back here on Wednesday. Our baseball series uh, returns. If you do have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.